Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Soulcast Media Live event. It is so wonderful seeing you all. I was watching the comments come in behind the scenes here. Yes, we are live right now. So before we even get started, if everybody can hear me and see me, can you give me a thumbs up or like a yes or something in the chat function just so I know all the tech is working. You know, sometimes with the tech stuff and virtual events, you never know what's going on. So this is my way just to see like you can hear me and everything is going great. Okay, I'm seeing some of the, the clapping, the thumbs up. Fantastic. Again, thank you and welcome. You are all here today because we're going to be talking about leadership presence at work. Now, this is a topic I'm so incredibly excited about because I love talking about these two things. I love talking about leadership and I love talking about presence, specifically executive presence. Now, before we dive into today's event, I want to just kind of do some quick housekeeping tips, especially if this is the first time you are joining. Now, I host these live events here on LinkedIn about every other week. And because Soulcast Media, which is my company, because we focus on communications, every event that we hold always revolves around helping you become a more strategic, clear, and confident communicator in the workplace. But we also drop in leadership tips and career tips. So whether you just started in your career, you've been working for a few years, or heck, maybe you're about to retire, I'm sure there are things we're going to be talking about that's relevant because that's the thing. Communications is one of those skills that can always be improved. Even if you feel like you're so good, there's always that, what, 10% that can make it better. So this is why we're here. This is what we're doing. Now, if this is the first time you're meeting me, I'll do a quick intro. So my name is Jessica Chen, and I am the founder and CEO of Soulcast Media. I started this company about five years ago, and it's such an amazing thing to say, but I've trained over 2 million people now how to improve their communications. It might be actually how you, you stumbled upon this event, maybe because you follow me on LinkedIn already. But yes, I've taught over 2 million people. Now, before that... I uh, used to be a TV journalist, as well as my guest, who I'm going to introduce in just a little bit. So I used to work on TV, and I did that for about 10 years. And it's funny because one of the reasons why I started Soulcast Media was because, and I always admit this, I was not very good at communicating. I started working on TV, and I noticed that every time I would speak, tons of filler words. I would feel super nervous thinking about speaking up in meetings where, you know, the industry is like a very aggressive and dominant where there's like a lot of big extroverted personalities. It was hard for me to like figure out, do I speak up? Do I chime in? How do I present? How do they do it so well? Right. These are the things that like would constantly like frustrate me. Now, I always joke that starting on TV was probably the best decision because you quickly learn how to be a great communicator, especially because it wasn't something that I felt I was very good at naturally. Now, fast forward 10 years, I, of course, picked up a lot of tips, a lot of tricks, and that's why I started Soulcast Media. It's because I get it. You know, I get why communicating can be so hard. Like you can be an expert in your field. You could have been working for many years, but even though you know your stuff, talking about it is a whole different skill. So that is why we're here today because we're going to talk all about communications. Now, I want to say you all have the chat function here on LinkedIn, so please use it. My guest and I, we're going to be having a conversation. We're going to be sharing our favorite tips, but it's very much a conversation with you. So if there's like, oh, Jessica, oh, hey, Anne, I do have a question. Put it into the chat function. I'm trying to monitor it as well. So without further ado, I'm so thrilled to bring up my guest. So my guest is Ann Kirian, and she is a motivational speaker as well as an executive coach. She's also one of our board of communicators here at Soulcast Media. And what that means is if you love Ann and you're like, I want to work with her, she offers one-on-one -on -one communications coaching through Soulcast Media, which you can find later on our website, soulcastmedia.com. So I'm excited to bring Anne up. Anne, welcome to Soulcast Media. 
Thank you. It's so great to be here and such an exciting intro. I'm, I'm ready. This is going to be so much fun. I know behind the scenes, you and I were talking about, okay, like what, what can we expect? What should we talk about? And for those of you who are here and you're like, okay, let's dive into it. We have a lot of tips we're going to share. So before we dive into that, Anne, can you share a little bit about you and the work that you do and how did you fall into helping people with their communications as well? Well, I think I tell people I was born with a microphone in my hand. Like my parents said, I used to take my brush or my comb and I would be talking and I would be playing records. Anybody's old enough to remember records. I would do all, I just wanted to be a communicator from a very young age. And I love to write. I was in young authors competitions. I had never had a problem writing papers. I just really wanted something that could combine the both and it made total sense to go into television. So I spent over 15 years as a news anchor reporter. I was in North Dakota, North Carolina, Florida, Iowa, and then I retired, <laughs> got out of television and had to think, what do I really love to do? And I, I, I still, I love to write. I love to talk. I love people. So it was really easy for me to go automatically into coaching. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing my Google searches, wondering what coaching is all about. And I stumbled across a Coach You page, which is where I got my accreditation. And they were talking about, do you like people? Do you like to ask questions? Are you the person that everybody goes to for advice? Even if they want the truth, do they come to you? And if they don't want the truth, they probably avoid you. And I was like, yeah, I think they're talking to me. This is, this is me. And so uh, it just came naturally to go into coaching. So I've had my own coaching and consulting company since 2007. And I do a lot of individual coaching and so proud and honored to be accepted into the Soulcast family. And I do a lot of motivational speaking on the road. I could do small groups. I've done large keynotes with up to a thousand people. So it, it still make, gets me a little bit nervous. So I understand when people say they're nervous, but that's good. And that means you're excited and you're ready and you, you are stepping outside your comfort zone and the satisfaction you get after completing that task, whatever it may be, is, is like no other feeling. I think it's like a runner's high for those that can relate to that. It's just a really, really great feeling. So I'm here to spread that type of joy and to help people in any way that I can. And that is why we are so excited that you're here. So there's a few things that you said, Anne, that I want to touch upon. You know, you mentioned your story about how it was very natural for you to want to get out there and communicate, listen, and, you know, just, you know, write, speak and all that. And it's funny because I feel like I was on the complete opposite end where at the time I hated having all eyes on me. I remember when I was growing up, my parents used to say, oh, Jessica, like, you know, you can't be so afraid of talking. Jessica, you have to be able to go out and like, you know, share what's on your mind. You know, I remember even when I was a kid, my parents would force me to when we were like at the grocery store, for example, and we would be checking out, they would force me to try to talk to people, the people who are helping you check out in, in those like low stakes situation, because they told me they were like, you know, if you can't communicate well, I mean, you know, you're not gonna be able to get your ideas across, you're not gonna be comfortable with it. So it's funny, because I feel like I was on the other end where my parents had to force me to speak, force me to communicate. And it was such a struggle, because when I would do it, people would say, A, they couldn't hear me, like I was talking in a really soft voice, or that I just had to do it more, right? Mm -hmm. So it's funny, because I feel like you and I are coming from both ends. Now, I want to dive into, you know, that confidence that you felt um, communicating, or let, let me say this, the nerves that you admitted having when you do public speak, because that is one thing that I want folks to, I guess, understand that no matter if you are an expert communicator, you've been doing this for a decade or two decades, we, I, you, we still feel nervous. I do a lot of speaking as well. And even though I do it as a living, I still get super nervous. I feel my heart pumping. So, so Anne, what are your thoughts on getting people to rethink it in the sense where it's not about eliminating it, it's about rethinking it? Yes, it definitely. It can't be a barrier. So people will say, I am so nervous. I could never do that. Or, 
you know, that's just something I've never been able to do. Oh, public speaking is one of the, my greatest fears. And if we look at it, like if you're nervous, then you should be fearful of it is not the right mindset. It means that you're excited. It means that you're, like I said earlier, kind of pushing the boundaries, pushing what you can do. And the main thing for me is being prepared. If you are prepared, you are ready. You should be confident. A, B, C. I remember when there was a group of us and we were training for a sprint triathlon, which is the smallest of them. So the big athletes out there are like, well, I do that every day. But it was a big deal for us. And I remember being so nervous, like, like feeling sick, nervous. And I talked to my coach and she said, we had hired a, a coach and she told us all, she said, you put in the work. You have, have to have confidence that you have put in the work. You know what you're doing. It's the same with public speaking. I have worked with subject matter experts who then get nervous, but I'll say, you know this inside and out. Nobody's going to ask you something that is going to put you on edge that you're going to be nervous about. And then we'll talk about little hints throughout, you know, maybe you you take some silence and as you're speaking, you say, and this is a powerful idea. And then you just stop. And you gather your thoughts and that sign, you know, people are afraid of silence, but that can give you confidence in a speech. I think sometimes we start talking and we think we have to keep talking and now I can't stop. And now my heart's racing and I think I'm, you know, going to just go into cardiac arrest. And that's, there are little tips and tricks, but the biggest thing is to have that type of confidence in your subject matter, in what you're going to talk about, get that little racing feeling. And believe me, when COVID came and we had to do all this technology stuff, I've probably been, I got more nervous all, all over again because I'm not techie. Just ask my three boys. They make fun of me all the time. And I said the other day, and it was a joke that I saw on Facebook, but I said, don't laugh at me about how I cannot program my phone. I taught you how to eat. <laughs> so, I mean, don't come down too hard on your mom. I, I did do some things that you didn't know how to do. So uh, it's just difficult sometimes with all the tech too. So I get it. I'm not as nervous about speaking, but I may be nervous about something else, or I may be nervous about the way I look or, you know, something didn't come together or my necklace might be falling off and that's going to bother. I mean, there's always going to be something. Don't let that be a deterrent for spreading the knowledge that you have. I love that. And I think for any of us who might have a workplace presentation coming up, or you're about to go into this high stakes meeting, it's almost accepting that nerves are part of the process, right? You know, if you try to be like, oh man, like I'm so nervous, it must mean I'm not prepared or I don't know my stuff. It's actually, no, it's what we what we just said, it's like, you know your stuff. You just got to believe it and just walk in. And the thing that you have to tell yourself is, let me just do the best job I can and trust that once I start talking, it'll just come out. And here's the thing. If you do stumble, what do you do? Just pause and just say, what I was trying to say is, and even just those few words I have found have saved so many people, because when they feel like they're standing there and they're like a deer in the headlights where everyone's staring at them and they're like, oh my gosh, I just lost my train of thought. That is actually a sentence to say. What I'm trying to say here is because it could help redirect where you were, what you were thinking. And it can also, you know, get everybody back on track. So number one, you know, don't feel like those nerves will ever go away. I think there's actually, and there's, isn't there something that's like performance is also linked to a little bit of stress, like without a little right. bit of stress, your performance won't be as high either. So that's right. to say it's all part of the process. Yes. If somebody, you know, somebody could be overconfident and I, I've seen that in, oh. in speakers sometimes they'll just be like, okay, you know, we're just going to go through this and wing this. And then all of a sudden, you know, maybe they're using a teleprompter and that goes down or, you know, something happens audio visual wise and they, they are flustered, you know, so it is good to have that, that little edge. And I love that, you know, that you're giving our audience words to say, like what I meant to say was, or let me rephrase that. Um, just give them, because a lot of people say maybe that's not what they're comfortable saying, but they might say, let me rephrase that. Or I'll say something like, 
how about I start that again? <laughs> you know, and I kind of make jokes about myself. That's not everybody's personality. But if I get going too fast, like, mm, too much coffee today, let me start over, you know, or whatever it may be to just kind of regroup everybody. And if I'm speaking to a, lo a larger crowd and I'm nervous, uh, sometimes I'll get up and I'll say, first of all, I'd like to, before I even get started, you know, I want to thank Jessica. I want to thank Alice and Jason and Ahmed and Sean and everybody for all the work they did today to put this together. Let's give them a round of applause. And then I can kind of be like, you know, a little exhale because everybody's, I'm up there. I know what it feels like to be in front, but I'm giving myself a break by, you know, giving applause or asking, you know, any questions or telling people where the restrooms are before I get started, just so I can kind of feel my way into my position as a speaker. I love that tip. You're basically almost priming yourself to get ready before diving straight into what you're planning to talk about by giving that introduction, like, you know, saying like, oh, thank you, you know, X person, X person, X person for for organizing this, it almost gets people used to the sound of your voice as well, which gets people to be like, okay, all right, let's get situated here, right? Versus right. diving straight in. And it also gives you that opportunity, what well, you just said, that opportunity to just breathe, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I know you have tips. I know you got lots of tips. So oh, let's tips. lots of tips. <laughs> so let's dive into it. By the way, for anybody who's watching right now, I actually want to get a temperature check. You know, Anne and I, we've been talking about presentation nerves. Does anybody here also feel it as well? Like let, let us know in the comments section, drop yes or no, or, you know, maybe, and just share, like, how are you feeling? Maybe even on a scale, hey, from a scale from one to 10, how do you feel like your overall communications confidence is right now? Let's say from a one is like, oh my gosh, it's so not good. Or 10, it's like, hey, you know what? I love it. I don't mm -hmm. think I'm terrible at it. I think I'm pretty good. Let us know in the chat function. And for those of you who are listening, in your minds, like where do you feel like you fall on this scale right now? And I love asking this question because I think it's a good reset for us to be like, okay, this is where I feel like I am because just having that self-awareness I do think is important for us to know, okay, what should we be working on now first? Right. So, right. all right, we're talking about leadership presence. And and I know you have some thoughts of what should people do? What should be what they should be thinking about when it comes to leadership presence? But before we dive into that, and do you have like a, an, a definition of like, what is leadership presence? Or what do those words mean to you when you hear it? When I think about leadership presence and knowing that was going to be the title of our conversation today people came to mind immediately came up in my in my mind who who I thought had a good leadership presence and and why I thought that so if i had a boss who was very enthusiastic yet complimentary yet uh, engaging could motivate other people um, didn't you know let people breathe let people talk let people be engaged at their own speed but yet be an incredible motivator just by his or her presence that's what I think leadership presence is it is all day every day uh, you know that's what the captain of the ship you know you can't just say well I'm not not going to guide the ship today. Good luck. You know, it's all day, every day. It's coming into work. It's being with your employees, your staff. It's being positive. And I know that's hard. I, I For those of you who might be in the position, you're like, I can't do that every day. I'm having a bad day or I'm doing this. But if the presence you give off is that no matter what comes your way, you're going to get through it. That's going to help everybody beneath you to feel that type of confidence as well. I love that. It's so funny. By the way, if you hear a little a little kid, my son just ran into the room, which is the beauty of live events. Okay. Yes. So one of the things that I wanted to add with leadership presence is I think of that term leadership presence as what people feel when mm. they see you or when they hear you speak it and it's sometimes it's like one of those things where you can't always put your finger on it but you're like wow when this person speaks up in a meeting when they're public speaking it's like the way they carry themselves the way they make me as a listener feel like i just feel like i'm gravitating towards them and this is the kind of communications that would 
fascinate me, especially early on when I was like on the other end of it, where I was like, gosh, it, it's so hard for me. How did, how did they do it? Right. That was what I was thinking. And, you know, through the years, and I'm going to share kind of my thoughts on this first, and Anne, I want to get your thoughts, but I have found that those who have that leadership presence, they're never focused on, oh, do I sound funny? Is, is my hair okay? Like, you know, do I know my stuff? Like when they go in and they speak, they're thinking about others so much and providing the most amount of value to their audience, whether it's one five or 15 people that it becomes about, let me try to help you. Let me try to help the team as much as I can. And there's a, a sense of, I feel passion that comes from that, that is totally captivating. And to me, that's what I think of when I think of le leadership presence. It's thinking about others and speaking in a way that has that conviction and that belief where everybody else is like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. It's kind of like what you said, motivating. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. It's somebody who makes you feel like you're the only person in the room. You might be if it's just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but they're talking to you. Um, there could be hundreds of people with you and you feel so engaged that you can't stop listening to them. I think the biggest compliment that I receive is someone will say, I, I could listen to you all day. I mean, I've done something to connect with them on a personal level. And that means more to me than, than any of the things you said, how my hair looked, what, <laughs> how it went over, what, you know, what the feedback was. It's, it's those individuals that come up to you afterwards and say, you know, this was really life-changing for me. I never thought of that this way, or I didn't know that I should handle something that way. I am going to go do it right now. Like they're instantly inspired. And, and that's really the goal. And one thing I want to add is, you know, some folks say, well, how do I develop that leadership presence if if I'm around my manager, like if if they're more senior than me? And this is especially so in, in work cultures or even, you know, specific countries where there's this like high power distance. That's what we call it, mm -hmm. where hierarchy and deference, you know, things like that um, are very important. It's like if I'm more junior does that mean I can't have leadership presence? And this is this one misconception that I want to just get rid of. Leadership presence does not have anything to do with the number of years you've worked. Leadership presence does not have anything to do with your title or if you happen to be more junior, which is why I said leadership presence is that feeling you give other people about, wow, like this person really understands me. This person understands my struggle. This person knows how to speak to the things I care about. And I would even argue that it is when somebody can develop that leadership presence that they start to become promoted into leadership roles because you've demonstrated that, hey, you can carry yourself as a leader. So, Anne, I, I want to dive into this now where people are like, are like, Okay, Anne, Jessica, I, I want to know what do I need to do? How do I need to do it to develop this? So Anne, I know you had some thoughts of what people can focus on. So what did you have in mind for people to kind of, you know, get going with how to develop this? Well, interestingly enough, I'd like to share a story of a client that I had, because I think this will help people understand. So she came to me and her boss had said that, he didn't feel she was engaged, that she was paying attention. Um, she was looked over for promotions and that she needed to do something to change. So she told him, well, I'm going to go get uh, a coach to help me. I'm going to get, you know, a, a presence, a speaking coach, a leadership coach. So we started and I will tell you, this is how our conversation started. We're on Zoom just like that. And she's like, she's kind of like this and she's in the lower corner and she's staring at the screen while we're talking. And so I said, I said, okay, just tell me, is, is this how you would be in a zoom meeting? Because that's, this is how we're all Brady bunch. For those of you old enough, we're all Brady bunch, right? Nobody, no, I mean, this is my first impression. This is all I can give you. You're not going to see much else. And so I said, is, is that how you are, sitting at the meetings and, and she's like yeah and i said do you do you have your mic on the whole time are you do you have your screen on she's like, so well sometimes i'll turn it off 
And I said, okay, before we even get into the art of speaking and leadership presence, we've got to take a few steps back and realize the impression we're giving off before we even start. So we worked on getting, you know, getting the camera right for her where she's sitting in the screen. She is engaged. And I said, you, are you nodding your head? Are you commenting? Are you in the comment saying, yes, great. Oh, good idea. Are you encouraging? She wasn't doing any of that. So after our first session, we went from sluggish, not interested in the corner to a, more of a leadership presence, more of a reaction, more of positive reinforcement, more smiling, more you know talking and giving feedback. We hadn't even started on what would come out of her mouth. And we were, I believe we were halfway there already because her, somebody else's perception of you is their reality. They look at you and their perception is what they think. Yeah. You can argue and say, I'm not like that. I, you know, I'm so engaged. I love my job. I, I do a good job. I want to be promoted. But if you're not showing that in your presence, your leadership presence, their perception is going to be that you're not. There's not going to be much of an argument. So let me see if you have any questions on that or if anybody else does before we move forward. But a lot of it comes before we even deal with speaking. I love what you just said because you just offered the quickest fix almost to giving the best first impression, especially if we're talking about virtual meetings. And you just you just showed us if you're logging in and you're like slumped over and you're or even if you're just like distracted by your other screen, people see that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't think that people aren't looking like for me. When I'm like on these Zoom calls, because we use Zoom mostly, it's like, you know, I'm looking like, do people, are people listening? Like, how are they truly feeling, right? So you want to make sure that you're giving the impression that you want to give. Now, I know a lot of you are asking, like, you know, what about like the backgrounds? Like, how do you actually do this? You know, I always feel that when you think about jumping into a video call, you want people to focus on you. Not so much about like, oh, okay, what, what's going on? So that means for me, I'm always like trying to minimize the distractions. But either way, you know, you want to treat this as first impressions matter, especially in a virtual environment. Okay. And what are your thoughts on now that we have how we show up, what right. we need to think about, what do we say, what do we do to develop that leadership presence? Well, and I think one of the biggest things is, as I said, even when you're speaking in front of people is to be prepared. I, a lot of times that I, I'm probably guilty of it sometimes too, is we're going to give a report on a, a Zoom or we're going to give a report in a boardroom or to our staff. And we, we, do, we don't even look at it before that time. And then we're going to pull it up and we're going to be like, oh, yeah, um, I talked to this person and they're going to get back to me on Friday. Flip notes, flip notes. You know, I mean, we're not prepared and confident and we need to do that. We need to be these here. I'm going to give you five steps. OK, super easy. Be mentally prepared, be physically prepared and practice, practice, practice. So when it gets to the point, we need to practice what we're going to say. On my way to speaking engagements, I talk to myself in the car the whole time. I'm like, good morning. How, how's everything? You know, and I sometimes I'll try to find a joke that is that will work for the crowd that I'm speaking to. If I'm speaking to a group of accountants, I'll find something funny about accounting or tax season. Uh, and I'll try to do something like that first, if that's the mood I'm going into, because it does lighten up things. Um, if it's a small group, I will try to let them introduce themselves as well. It gives me a break as a speaker. Plus I get to know my audience and I can speak to them directly, even calling them by name. Uh, that is a very good tactic, but I need to practice what I'm going to be saying. And I don't think enough people do that because they're like, what am I going to do? Just talk to myself. Yeah, <laughs> you're going to talk to yourself unless there's someone else that wants to listen. But uh, you're going to talk to yourself. You're going to talk out loud. You're going to make sure that the words flow. You're going to make sure that you can keep things organized in your head as you're going through things. If you need notes, that's great. Look down at your notes, but don't be scrambling through your notes. So again, that's why uh, tips three, four, and five are all practice, practice, practice. 
And and you probably before we jumped on this call, you were already thinking about, OK, what are actually some of the things I can talk about? You're preparing for this as well. Right. right. So there's actually a really good question. And it's from Allison where she's asking about extrovertedness and introvertedness and how that shows up in leadership presence. And upon first glance, right, when we think of leadership presence, it seems like, oh, the extroverted people, like they just got it. Like they they know. But for us introverted folks, like it's a bit harder, but it is so true. I don't think leadership presence has anything to do with extrovertedness or introvertedness. And, you know, in some ways being introverted helps you be more perceptive of what's going on, what's the situation. A lot of introverted folks, and I can say this because I'm introverted myself, like I like to kind of just like observe first and then find that right opportunity to to chime in. When I feel being introverted can hurt is when we actually don't speak up at all because we're so introverted that we tend to mute ourselves. And I used to struggle with this as well, where I was like, well, you know, as long as I'm showing that I'm like listening, like that's like, isn't that the most important? Yes. But unless you participate, people don't really know, like, does Jessica get it? Does Jessica care? Is Jessica interested? And I think that for me was something that I had to overcome in thinking that being introverted didn't mean I couldn't speak speak up and communicate. You know, it was just about trying to be like finding that right moment to chime into meetings. And, you know, here at Soulcast Media, we offer so many of these tips, but, you know, without diving so much into it, I will say like when you are chiming into a meeting, one of my favorite things is to actually anchor. That's, That's the tip. Anchoring basically means you are repeating one or two words the person before you just said as a way to seamlessly insert yourself into the conversation. Because what often does happen is like if somebody wants to chime in, they'll just kind of like, and we've seen this, they'll bulldoze their way in. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's like so abrupt. But instead, and this is actually, I think what Anne and I are doing in our conversation today, I'll be like, Anne, that's a really interesting point that you said about motivation, right? So I'm anchoring Anne's statement and I'm connecting it to what I want to say next. And again, that creates a beautiful seamless communications, I think. So that's one tip that I like to share. No, I love that. I love that. And that's, I think that's an important tip to share even for us extroverts, because sometimes somebody will be giving an idea and in my head, I my filter is much better as I get older. I mean, I've been doing this for you know 30 years now, but sometimes in my head I'm thinking, there's no way that's gonna work. There's no way that is gonna work, you know, because we're doing a volunteer board or something. Does not come out of my mouth. What does come, because this is practice, this is practice every day. So to assume somebody just knows how to do these things it is not correct. Sometimes you have to hold back and my kids will tell you I can be extra like that's what they <laughs> refer to it as. So they will say things like that. And so I know to watch myself and I even have to practice at home. So if my oldest is saying something, I'm like, Mm-mm, not going to work, not going to work. I-, I will let him finish. And then I'll say, you know what? I think that's a really great idea. But could we possibly do this instead? And so what you're saying by tagging on to get into the conversation us extroverts kind of need to calm it down to get into the conversation because I myself have witnessed and have probably done it myself back in TV days when you have one minute to discuss something with 10 people, everyone's just, you know, I've never seen that type of aggressive conversation again in my career outside of, except in a newsroom. So you you have to get in fast. That isn't going to work. Let's do this. And there's no time for the niceties there always is time for the niceties. It takes a couple seconds to just say, I think that's a great idea, but what do you guys think of this? And now everybody might shoot that down too, but at least you're not making the person feel bad. So I hope my extroverts out there can kind of calm that bulldozing that you talked about coming in, because it is something, it's something we have to work on. We've always been told that, you know, oh, you have great ideas, you need to share them, or you're a leader in this group, or I need to hear what you're thinking. I promoted you for a reason. You know, that's the feedback that extroverts parents probably gave them or that their bosses gave them. And so we're like, oh, you're right. I got to step in and fix this. We need to know how to tone that down too. And I think that is also what inspires leaders. 
people who can be in that type of environment, but still be calm. Uh, they are a better leader than somebody who maybe is an extrovert, but just blurts things out, hurts people's feelings, just says things to say things to get, you know, hear themselves talk. They don't have the leader uh, leadership presence that is needed, unfortunately. You just touched on something that I feel is so important. And it's and I and I say this because so the book that I have coming out this summer called Smart Not Loud. And mm -hmm. I haven't talked too much about this yet because I've because I know we're still a ways away. But yes, this book is called Smart Not Loud. It's published by Penguin Random House. And if you're interested in anybody who's interested in learning more, um, you can just head to my LinkedIn and you know, go in and there's a link for you to like join our book insider club, which is how I notify people. But you brought up something that is so important, and that is how how the way we were raised may affect how easily leadership presence comes to us, right? You talked about how, you know, for some, you know, parents, you know, and I'm just thinking about like my own parents, for example. So I grew up in a, in a fairly conservative home where it wasn't really about speaking up. They never really encouraged me, for example, to get out there and, and, and share my ideas. Yes, they wanted me to communicate and talk to people, but it wasn't about, oh, Jessica, your ideas are so important. People must know about it. Like that encouragement was never something that I felt like they really focused on. It was more like, Jessica, yes, communication is important. You have to learn how to communicate. But I didn't always get that validation, basically, is mm -hmm. what I'm saying. And I think that also affected my confidence in some ways, where on the other side, you're saying, and there's definitely some folks who are raised where they tell their kids, you're brilliant. You're amazing. You got to get out there. Like You got to share, right? And I think that definitely affects the way we show up in the workplace. And I know that was actually one of the questions in the chat. It's like, how do we show up? And I think doing a little bit of introspection can also help us develop that confidence today where we are all working professionals and, and how that affects us, right? Mm -hmm. So. I completely agree. And it's and it's important. Um, and I hate to talk about COVID, but it always is coming up, right? Uh, because it's it's still so so new and so fresh to all of us. But our kids and our young adults who lived through COVID and didn't communicate, they lost time. And I think that is pure evidence of how communication can be lost if you don't keep up with it. It's a skill. You have to keep practicing. It is something that we do every day and something that we all can get better at. And that is evidence that if you don't do it, you're not going to get better because now they're coming out of their shells and they're having to communicate with people. They're having to get out of the house. They're having to talk in person. And, and it's worrisome sometimes because I'll write this whole paragraph to somebody, uh, maybe a millennial or someone, and they'll just write back, okay. <laughs> you know, where I was taught much like you probably to write and thank you for writing. I appreciate your feedback. I will get back to you so, as soon as I can. Thanks. You know, right. You know, these are the type of things we do, but they're just like, uh, okay. Or my kids will write IDK, which means I don't know. <laughs> and then the conversation ends. So I, we have to work on those things, but I, I do think it's important um, that when we look at, if you have kids at home or if you have you know, you're related to millennials or working with millennials to get them talking. I have a 14 year old, he's my youngest, and we'll go out to eat and um, they'll say, well, what does he want? And I'll say, well, you know, order, <laughs> order what you want. What, what are you, what questions do you have? Or he'll say, mom, does this have onions or this? And it just starts at that little bit because I will see other parents and they'll be like to their teenagers. That's like, he'll have this, he'll have that. They're not letting their kids speak. And it's just an, it's just interesting to say, how are they going to be confident when you're not around? You need to let, and if they say something wrong, kind of step in and correct them, maybe away from their friends, but give them that opportunity to have that type of confidence. Um, and that is, in my opinion, there might be parents out there who say, oh, my kid doesn't know what he wants. It'll take forever. He wants a cheeseburger, you know, and that's fine. It's, it's, 
I'm not criticizing anybody, but those are things that my parents did for me that I can readily say I've done for my kids. And they're all, they're all comfortable speaking. Um, they also ha had great schooling where they all went to the same elementary school and they had speech competitions and poetry competitions and they had to memorize things from the time they were very little. So shout out to St. Patrick's School in Mostyn, Wisconsin, because um, they helped raise some really wonderful people. I love that. And I think that's actually, maybe that should be another topic one of these days on Soulcast Media, talking about how our childhood and how the way we were raised affects how we show up in the workplace today. And actually, you know what? I might, just because that is definitely the thesis of this book that I have. And I have to give a big uh -huh. shout out to my friend, Priscilla, who's actually on this. She just dropped a link where for those who want to join this book insider club, which is kind of where you get notified of my book. Like I said, I haven't talked too much about it, which I know I probably should start talking about it because it comes out in July. But yeah, Yes, it's called Smart Not Loud. And actually, um, a quick way to get to that book insider, you know, news like, you know, this page is if you just go to soulcastmedia.com slash book, and it'll basically register you to get notified of when more details and bonuses are, are going to come out. So thank you, Priscilla, for dropping that in. Now, I do have one question, and that is for those of us who are in our jobs right now, and they feel like maybe the impression their manager has of them is not of that leadership presence that we're talking about. Maybe that manager thinks like, oh, like you said before, I'm not that engaged or I'm not showing that I'm that engaged. Is it too late to change people's perception of us in the workplace where we're like, okay, you know, after listening to Jessica and Anne talk about leadership presence, I want to now try to bring it in a little bit more, but, but do it in a way that doesn't feel abrupt or unnatural because we can't, you know, get off this call and then suddenly go into our next meeting and be like, hello, everybody. <laughs> like, you know, that's just so, everyone will be like, are you okay, Jessica? Like yeah. a bit too much coffee this morning, yeah. <laughs> right? So, right? So how do you do it in a way that feels right where you're like, I do want to improve this leadership presence, but how do I do it in the right way? Any tips on that, Anne? Yeah. And that, First of all, it's never too late. It's never too late. Uh, I, I mean, I, we can't control other people, right? We can't control their thoughts. But what I tell people is if you don't like how you are being perceived or you don't like what people are saying about you, you have really two choices. You can keep doing or whatever you're, you're doing and just take what everybody says and not let it bother you, or you can change. Okay, so obviously, if you want to be a leader and you don't think people are seeing you that way and it's something you want to do, then it does take some change on your part. It does take I know my coaching clients that I work with, I require a three month minimum commitment because it takes 90 days for any type of habit to become really routine. And that's with anything that's with dieting or not smoking or whatever. It, that 90 day frame is out there for a reason because it, it truly does take that long. And so you need to think, what are the things first? What are you doing that you can improve on? I mean, because a lot of people say, I, I, like the client I talked about earlier, I'm doing everything I can. Well, are you, or as my kids say, are you really? <laughs> so we have to look at that. What are the things that you can change? And if there are things you can't change, then we have to let those go. Um, maybe there's something that happened in the past that you just want to get past. Well, you can't change that. It's gone. It's over. Don't We don't need to focus. That's why the front windshield is bigger than the rear view mirror because we're going forward. So we're taking you from where you are going forward. We're going to find out what you can change. We are going to put things into action and then maybe even a conversation with your superior or your supervisor or your boss to just do a check-in, make sure it's scheduled. Most bosses don't like to be just dropped in on, especially for something that's not urgent. Make sure it's a scheduled time and go in and just say, you know, over the last um, 30 days, I want, you know, I've been working with a coach. Um, I see myself improving. I wanted to know if you saw it too. I'm trying to speak up at meetings. I'm making sure that I'm arriving, you know, at least 15 minutes ahead of time. So I am ready to go and confident whenever we start. I am making sure that I, I don't take longer breaks because I want you to know that I am, I am here. I am dedicated. I'm, there's all these things that you 
haven't, if you haven't been doing them, you need to do, and then you can express them and see what kind of feedback you get, because I bet it will be positive and you'll be on your road to achieving more of a leadership presence. I think for me, the key word about how to develop that leadership presence, it comes down to this one word, and that is being proactive. Mm -hmm. I cannot stress how being proactive and a lot of the things you just talked about, Anne, of like showing up, taking that initiative, you know, even just like being on time, but even being proactive in trying to join projects, even yeah. suggesting projects to do, to launch. And it can be something small because, hey, let's be real. We all, we're all busy. But yes. just showing yes. that proactiveness of like, I'm thinking about this. I have this really good idea. Let me just pitch it to my boss. You know, just the proactiveness, I think, is synonymous to leadership presence. Now, I do want to make this one comment because you also mentioned how there are certain things in us that we cannot change. And that's nothing that we should be focusing on. And because I have a large international audience, I want to make this point where a lot of people get stuck on if they speak with an accent, they feel like they cannot develop that leadership presence, especially if they work in a global environment where it's not their native tongue. And I always tell folks, having an accent or not having an accent has nothing to do with leadership presence, which is why Anne and I never talked about accents to begin with. We're talking about all these other things for you to think about, that proactiveness, being able to walk into a room, like that feeling that you give to somebody, you know, which is why when we say like it's having that conviction, having that belief, those are the things that really make a difference when people will turn around and then listen to what you have to say. So accents and, and, and things, and even sometimes grammar, to be honest, like people don't really focus on that. Heck, I use grammar wrong all the time, you know, <laughs> but like for me, I don't get hung up on it. I just, you know what? I, for me, I'm here because I want to help you. I want to help our, our listeners. I want to help everybody get the most value out of it. And to me, that's what I care about. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And I thank you for bringing that up because I do see a lot of people from all over the world on this today. So it's nice to see you all. And no, it has absolutely nothing to do with it. And you have to realize that everybody has something they could think had something to do with it. Like, am I too old to be a leader? And will I not be a leader because I'm a woman? Will I not be a leader because I am I have children and I have other priorities? Everybody has something and none of it should matter. It really shouldn't. And obviously, going back to your comment, those are things that we can't do anything about anyway. Um, you know, it, and things that we should be proud of. Uh, we should be proud of our our heritage, our dialect, um, whatever the case may be. So I say it's a badge of honor because there's a big push right now for diversity in leadership positions. And so step up and be loud and proud, whatever you represent and uh, just show that you have the ability to do it because I think the world is starving for people that look different and talk different and are different to give us different perceptions and new ideas on things. And we can't get that if we're all the same. Absolutely. Diverse voices matter yeah. in the workplace. So, oh my gosh, I can't believe we've been talking for close to an hour, Anne, and I feel oh like gosh. this just flew by. So as we start to wrap up here, are there any, and I call them golden nuggets, are there any golden nuggets that you would love our audience to walk away with today after listening to, to our, our, our episode of Leadership Presence for them to be like, okay, now that I've listened in, what is this one thing that I need to do or I need to think about to help propel me forward? Do you have anything in mind that you want to share? Well, just I want to go over those those five things again. So you want to be mentally prepared, physically prepared and practice, practice, practice. Now, what does mentally prepared mean? Mm -hmm. If you are scheduled to speak at a big meeting on, let's say, Monday morning, um, Sunday night is chill night. I mean, don't stay up, you know, watching Netflix on your phone. You know, do what I say, not what I do uh, until all hours, because you have something that's a really big deal the next day. And, and don't be on your phone scrolling because you're saying, well, I can't get to sleep. Well, well, you can't sleep because you're on your phone scrolling, you know, so we need to be mentally prepared. If you have a chance to role play with someone, oh, my husband, the pillow talk we have had where he has to listen to me speak ahead of time, uh, because they might just pick up on something that says, you know, 
I don't know if I'd say that part or, you know, what does that mean exactly? And if you're open to that sort of criticism, then you have somebody else who can help you with that. But make sure you're feeling good. Uh, I've told managers many times that I work with, if they have a big meeting and they have to go in and talk to somebody, or let's say it, they have to let people go, uh, uh, whatever the case may be, and the, you've got the butterflies and the nerves. If they're not feeling well the day before and they can postpone that, I always say, please do it. Oh, well, everybody's going to be upset. This was supposed to happen. This was a meeting. I said, I can't tell you how many times somebody has gone forward and it has been disastrous because if you have the power to change something like that, the managers out there, you don't want to risk your career when you might say something you wouldn't have otherwise had you had more than two hours sleep because the baby was up crying all night. You know, we really want to have our best foot forward. We want to have all those things lined up as far as perception goes and how we're going to appear before we even start talking. And if you're not mentally prepared, if you're not physically prepared, it's not, it's not going to go well, unfortunately. So mentally prepared, physically prepared, feel good about yourself. There is still research out there that when you dress up, you feel better about yourself, despite the casual workplaces and kids wearing sweatpants to school. It, the research is there. You feel better about yourself. You reflect more positivity. So physically prepared, mentally prepared, practice, practice, practice. Those are the five key elements. And yes, practice, practice, practice are each one of its own. Yes, yes. So for me, I would just say it goes back to leadership presence is being proactive. In other words, it's action. Leadership presence isn't something that people are not necessarily, they're not necessarily born. Like I'm not born with leadership presence, right? A lot of it is learned and applied and done in the workplace. And so I would just say for everybody who's watching, listening, know that whether you are just starting out, you've been working, or you've been working for many, many years, there's always room for us to rethink how we show up. And I bet, you know, the fact that you are all here and this is amazing, you're listening, this is probably something that you care about. So I hope Anne and I were able to offer you some sort of you know, inspiration, a bit of motivation for you to think about this. And, and that's why we're grateful. And that's why we're doing this. Because how often do we even get to think about this? Probably not very often, especially because we're all so busy, right? So I just want to thank you all for taking the time and listening. And hopefully you all feel inspired about like, okay, how can I better show up, leave a great impression, be proactive, and show up? in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So with that, Anne, I just want to say thank you so much for, for joining us today. How can people get in contact with you? Well, I would say the easiest is probably to go through Soulcast and go through Jessica. And she has me as a, a communication person on her staff. And I would love to connect with you that way. And then you can learn more about everything Soulcast has to offer as well. Yes. So the, the site is soulcastmedia.com. And Anne, is one of our board of communicators, meaning you can work with her. Um, and there's a lot of people who have coaches that you you may be surprised, but if you're interested in working with a one-on-one -on -one coach, Anne's right here, she can work with you. So you can just find her on our website. Okay, two things. So we are launching our masterclass starting today. So for those of you who have not heard this, I've been talking about it nonstop, but basically next week I'm hosting a two-day live workshop it's called Professional Communications Skills. And you can join me as I teach you skills like public speaking, how to develop executive presence, and how to influence and persuade people. The sign up just dropped today. So if you are interested in signing up for this free two-day workshop, the website is soulcastmedia.com slash masterclass, and it'll take you directly to that sign up page. Highly recommend you sign up for it if you want to learn more communication tips. The second thing is, yes, I do have that book coming out in July, and it is something that I'm so incredibly excited about because it's not just a communications book. It's really talking about how a lot of the way we were raised, depending if we grew up in a quiet culture, that's what I call it, or a loud culture, 
it can affect our confidence in the workplace. And then, of course, I talk about all the communication tips. If you do want to join our Book Insider, which is how I notify people of book news, book updates, which is definitely going to ramp up later this year when we get closer to launch, you can do that by going to soulcastmedia.com slash book, and that'll take you to Book Insider. So, Anne, again, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to give a big, big thank you to all who stayed. I see you all. And I hope to see you at our next event, which you can also find on our website. So with that, take care, everybody. And Anne, thank you so much. Thank take you. care.